Welcome. It's Jeff Mayhew. It's John Beatty. It's Politics and Parenting, where we talk about politics, but we talk about it differently. John, how are you doing today? Doing really well, Jeff. How are you? I'm good. I noticed you got a new setup. Yeah, so uh, Katie was gone this weekend, and I had some time on Friday to reorganize the bookshelves. So I um, put the books into different categories, and there's books upstairs in, uh, in our sort of uh, religious and spirituality section. And then right behind me, I got my politics section here. But um, one of the things we did on the weekend, which was uh, brave, if I may be so bold, uh, I took the kids <laughs> to Costco. Um, and so, you know, like when you go to Costco, you're just like filling your cart with all sorts of stuff. And it reminded me of this podcast I was listening to as I was moving the books around from uh, Matt Lewis and the news. And he introduces his long lost cousin, Hiram Lewis, who <laughs> has this fascinating idea about politics and ideology and how we think about it wrong. And um, when it, when I was listening to it, just like it, it clicked to me. And then I texted you about it and you're like, yeah, we should definitely do this podcast about it. So, but like the key, the key thesis and uh, is kind of, there is no really like left wing, right wing. That's more just like marketing terms. Mm -hmm. And I've always thought about this, but it's never really been clear. Like how to, um, you know, I guess crystallize it or something or like explain around it. And, and, you know, like, I love the example because like people call, um, was it Noam Chomsky? No, uh, Noam Chomsky is a socialist. Um, Milton Friedman. Milton Friedman is a right winger, oh, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. and Adolf Hitler is a right winger. Right. Um, which is, doesn't make any sense because Adolf Hitler was a socialist, and Milton Friedman was a free market economist, and then uh, Adolf Hitler hated the Jews, and Milton Friedman was was Jewish. So, like, right. what? You know, it doesn't make any sense. And his his whole conceit is like, we just tell these stories post post hoc, and this totally makes sense in the context of like the rise of Trumpism, basically, where. We used to think that uh, character mattered. You know, uh, yeah. I like to think that you and I still believe that. But um, when you get a guy who's kind of brash in the White House, everyone just sort of toes a line. And, and um, you know, in the parlance of, uh, of Hiram, like they just purchase Twinkies and they say Twinkies have always been good for you. And Twinkies are the same as kale. Um, and they're like, you know, like it's just that was eye opening to me to think about it this way. And it's so true. And I think that's kind of what we're trying to do with the Madison Republicans is Put some more veggies into the cart and um, make the uh, the health of our republic a little bit better. Yeah, I mean, you text me about it. It's funny because I listened to this podcast last week and it like struck me immediately. Like I was, I love like nerding out on stuff like this, and I can tell. Um, well, so first, let me just for the audience's sake, um, Hiram Lewis is not actually related to Matt Lewis, right? So, and we 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 know, uh, we listen to Matt Lewis a lot. He's a really, uh, he writes for the Daily Beast. Um, we actually took a leadership class, uh, leadership institute class that he taught, really fantastic guy. And so we listen a lot and I listened to this thing that Hiram Lewis came up with and I'm like, I, I feel like he was speaking directly to me. I mean, when <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I was like, man, this, like you said, it just, it kind of clicked. It's like, this is what I've been trying to tell people. Um, but I haven't been telling people like that, you know? Um, and, uh, yeah, I think he does a really good job of, of breaking down, you know, explaining that there, there really are no, you know, the, what you believe is what you believe. Right. And you can't right, change right, right. what you believe just because your team tells you to, you know, and, and you should stick to those beliefs and you should, he's not saying we get rid of parties. He's saying we make more parties, right? More, more, you know, like the essence of capitalism, the essence of Republicanism is you break the groups down into the smallest possible manner, you know, divide it out because then it's easier to, to work with. Um, he talks about it in the way he says, go granular. Um, I think that might be a little bit hard for like a regular person to understand. Um, but if you, if you're like, okay, well, how do you solve a big problem? You make it small. Right. And, and sometimes you divide it in two, sometimes you divide it in four, sometimes you divide it in six. Um, and I think that's kind of what he's trying to explain here as far as like our beliefs and like how we layer them. Um, so it was a really interesting podcast. I actually, I shared it on Twitter to somebody that I've like that, uh, that I follow and I'm like, here, listen to this. And then you came to me and you're like, let's talk about this. So it struck both of us, um, which, you know, to me says it's, it's a great idea. <laughs> I got to get the yeah, no, just I mean, like it resonates, you know, I think that's the key thing. And I think like the, the whole granular spot is what we're missing so much in our politics, because it is so much of like, well, you've got to be a team player and you got to you got to buy into everything that everyone else is saying on the team. 
And if you don't buy into it, well, then, you know, I I hate this term, but like you get called a rhino if you're a Republican. Um, And I don't know if the Democrats have a certain way. They think they're just twist arms behind the scenes. But, you know, like, you know, if you don't if you don't agree with, with whatever the party basket is, so to speak, like you just get ostracized and pushed away. And, and I think that like, that's it's such a problem because part of the idea of parties is to help people get elected. Right. And so like at the beginning of the podcast, um, Matt kind of, I guess, you know, explains like Hiram's position a little bit, you know, saying that the the left and the right, they're not fixed uh, enduring philosophical belief systems, but they're more social groups whose ideas, attitudes, and issue positions change con- are constantly change, which, yeah, I think he's right. Um, now, mm-hmm. I do think that there is some ideological bent, you know, from our founding, and I've written about it. I wrote about it in uh, the History of the United States Part One, and then I touch on it again in the Threads of the Republic. And as I continue to write these stories, basically telling the story of our country and how it was born from the perspective of the people, the parties, and the powers that were in charge at the time, um, because not all powers come from inside the government. Sometimes they're corporate. You're going to learn about that later. But, um, you know, I think and I go, there was one underlying thing that separated people from the very beginning. And that was the idea that people could govern themselves or they needed to be ruled. And that is where you start with the anti-federalist and the federalist. Um, and the anti-federalists were, it's not, the, it's not a, you know, they, they believe that people can govern themselves um, and they they wanted to be able to do that on a close level, and they figured by moving the power higher up, further away from them, they'll have less control over it. Um, and you know, James Madison comes up with the House of Representatives. Um, you layer out the representation. You make sure that every nation or every state has a Republican government, and you kind of solve that problem a little bit uh, to a degree, or at least you try to. You find balance, um, and then afterwards, those parties morph, and the Federalists become the party that is like more federal government you know we need people people don't know how to take care of themselves we need to do it for them to protect them from themselves we need to protect them from the foreign nations and the democratic republicans that were like no we can take care of it ourselves you know we can do this at the state level and i think what you what happens and i write about this in the threads um is the power like the democratic republicans are are kind of right but they also become what they weren't, you know, Jefferson's Louisiana Purchase, the tariff of abominations, like you you actually end up being the thing that you're fighting against. And that's how Andrew Jackson rises to power, that populist power. He breaks the power structure. And ever since then, we kind of lost that idea of like limited federal government because – and I'll write about this in, in the next uh, series that I'm going – is what you find during the Jacksonian era – is you find a bunch of people that were supposed to be fighting for limited government, but they what they were really fighting for was slavery. That's where their focus was. Because if they really cared about limited government, they wouldn't have done some of the things they would have. What you know, they would have been focused on protecting that. But they were willing to make concessions if it benefited mm-hmm. slavery. And you know, that's not really your belief anymore, is it? You know, the limited government. And I think a perfect example of this is John C. Calhoun. Right. Who, when you read his limited government stuff, you go, man, this guy knows what he's talking about. And then you read his stuff on slavery and you're like, no, no, he doesn't. (laughs) You know, or like, or you don't want to agree with him on on these things because because they're bad. And it's like you were the guy that was supposed to be fighting for limited government, but you weren't. And that's why, you know, that's that was the, the birth of the Democratic Party. And that's where the idea of like you know, getting the people to vote and you created this culture where you shape the story, right? Like, and Hiram talks right. about this in the podcast, you shape a story around your beliefs. And so slavery is what you believe in now um, because it's economically, you know, tied to your interest. And so you create a story of why it's good for people and why people, the federal government can't take it away. And you and you do all this stuff. Um, I think our country would have been better served if they would have just like, acknowledge the evil, let it go quietly like it was supposed to go um, instead of fighting for something like that. And then we as a people would have been better served realistically because there is still a large portion of people that believe in limited federal government. It's just that there's nobody in politics that actually believes that anymore because those bro, because they're social groups now, like he Hiram talked about, you have people on both sides that believe in limited government and people on both sides that believe in big federal government and big federal government has been winning for over a hundred years. Um, and that's yeah, not great. 
<laughs> no, and it's, you know, it goes back to like the organizing principles right at the beginning. Because if you've got something you can sell, it becomes much easier to tell, talk to people about that. And so if you're trying to sell people on a particular issue, uh, if it's slavery because of it, uh, the, the economic interests of people, if it's in our current day, if it's like the um, Medicare, Medicaid, you know, like that's an easy thing to say, like, we're going to give you this, we're going to give you this, it's, you, you want this. Um, and I think it, that is much easier to run on. Um, you have to, you could do less work as a politician. Right. You can outsource more. Um, and then that's how these, the status quo kind of comes in. And you, you know, having a fight over <clears throat> the ability to govern yourselves or to let someone else govern or like where the balance is in there, that's really fine. That's a really uh, fine balance. And it's a nuanced discussion that doesn't fit in a 30 second soundbite or a right. uh, five page pamphlet that gets printed and, you know, mailed out. Um, so I like, I think that's where we get stuck right now. It's, it, it is that tribalism. It is that sense of you've got a someone gives you a, a bill of a shopping list and you got to buy everything on that shopping list otherwise you're not part of the social club anymore yeah and and so Hiram another point that he makes in the podcast that are really really strikes me is the way that he talks about it's a story like the, these people mm -hmm. they come up with the things that they believe in and then they craft a story around it and um he talks about like, sometimes you craft bad stories. And I think that's, you know, that's what you get with slavery. You know, they, they used, they used the Bible to defend slavery, you know, like, and I just, I, I can't get past that. Um, and I, it struck me cause I'm reading this book, um, indivisible. Um, and it's about, you know, the expanding nationalism in, in, in America. And it's funny cause it talks about everything that I just described, you know, how the power structure changed and how it was broken and how we ended up moving into this very nationalistic policy, this bigger federal government. And, um, but, you know, talk about bad stories, you know, it's not that the, it's not that the book is incorrect per se, but I think they craft the story incorrectly. And the author, I think he really understands the events, but I don't think he took the time or at least maybe doesn't want to, or maybe just didn't have the information, but to, to understand the people. And mm -hmm. there's a couple reasons for this. So in, in the introduction, he goes, uh, you know, this is just talking about what's going on. He says, President Andrew Jackson appealed to the dark side of nationalism. Jackson's populist nationalism defended American identity as exclusively white. His ruthless displacement of Native Americans, violence aimed at the Spanish, Mexicans, and British, and insistent defense of slavery and white supremacy won him popular support and unprecedented powers. So there is a lot to say is incorrect about that statement, <laughs> in my opinion, about Andrew Jackson. Um, first, if his first goal was to defend slavery, he would have allowed nullification to happen in 1828, okay? Plain and simple. Um, his first goal was defending the union, and, and that was how he executed his presidency. Now, you may not agree with the things that he did, and he certainly doesn't have the greatest record as far as he definitely owned slaves, but, it, you know, so did a lot of people, right? I mean, an entire, you know, half of the country owned slaves, um, but it's not like that was his purpose. He fought against John C. Calhoun. He broke the power structure. He separated that stuff out because he wasn't willing to go along with something that defied the rules of government. He was telling future Americans, look, this is the most important thing, not slavery. And, and so just, just that alone says that this wasn't his ideology. Now, where I can understand where the author might have missed something is the, the power structure that he built – the people that were behind him, the John C. Calhouns, the the other ones that rose up and kind of took over after him, the James K. Polk, mm -hmm. right? They may have had those ideas. They may have been okay with it um, because they had, for the most part, grown up outside of the founding era. They don't remember the real argument for limited government that happened. They're getting it's a story that's now being retold to them. They didn't feel right. the tough situation of lack of representation that they faced um, going against the British. So yes, the power structure that came from Andrew Jackson was all very racist in a lot of degrees. Uh, I, I would agree with that, but I don't think that Andrew Jackson was in that mindset. And he, the author, goes on later in the book to call Andrew Jackson a racist. Uh, because of his Indi Indian policies and the way that he treated the Indians. And again, 
I go back and you go, you're leaving out some very important information to the reader. You're not telling the reader that Andrew Jackson um, adopted an Indian boy and raised him as his own son. You're not telling the reader that the way that Andrew Jackson perceived the Indians was as sovereign state powers. OK, and it was his responsibility. He was a general in the army. He was the executive of the military. He was in charge of our safety. If they were attacking American settlers, it was his responsibility to take care of it. You do mention that he's ruthless to the British, the Spaniards and the French, I believe, maybe not the French, but in that aspect. And it goes, he was just treating the Indians like he treated every other opponent. Right. And you mm -hmm. need people that have that ability to do it because otherwise you'll just get run down too. And, um, you know, so it's important to make sure you get your facts straight when you're telling the story and you give all the information because that's how we get off in these ideological beliefs because we, we, we cast emotion and like, you know, empathy at people and we wield it against them. And you go, well, you can't really like Andrew Jackson because he was a racist. Now you're a racist. And it's like, well, he wasn't really not the way that you're describing it. You're leaving out a lot of information I think you should give to people. Um, but I mean, overall, the book is very good. He, he understands what happened very well. He explains it in a very, uh, you know, concise manner. I just think that, uh, you know, we have to do better about sharing those stories. And and Hiram touches on this in the podcast about how important it is to craft a, a good story. Yeah, and you know, people are complicated. And I think you make a lot of good points that you can gloss over some details because it doesn't fit that narrative that you're trying to craft. And, um, uh, you know, I, th I think uh, we get, we're so stuck in our current set. And I think um, that's what, Matt Lewis talks about where he's trying to describe people and pigeonhole them because, you know, I guess the, the thing with the story is it's sort of a, a shorthand, you know, when you say someone is a Republican or a Democrat, theoretically that uh, applies sort of a, a gloss to them, a, a coat of paint, of positions, of issues, and you can say, okay, I know where these people stand. And I think one of the problems is, is um, and this is the thing that, you know, we've we're trying to do with a, a faction is even that gloss has its own little cracks in it and there's different um you know like a prism it separates the colors and stuff there's different colors that make up each one of those sides and there's different issues in this and i um another discussion i was listening to today about foreign policy and stuff and how traditionally republicans have been very strong on foreign policy and they're you know gung-ho about it you know like the reagan going after russia but the point was that Nixon was actually one of the strongest proponents of detente when he was president, but he's a Republican. So like, this is the, the challenge is like, you know, these political parties are aggregates of issues. They combine them together to form coalitions in order to win. But someone, uh, you know, the, the, the combinations of those aggregates can be different based on the issues. Or someone can decide like, yeah, this is what I was campaigning on. But the context is so different. I, you know, I know more information about it. You know, it's it's not just a Chinese spy um, balloon. It's just a weather balloon because we've got CIA information that knows that it's just they're just collecting weather data, or vice versa. You know that they're trying to steal all sorts of secrets, and you got to take it down, but you got to do it in a in a way that makes it seem like you know, oh, it's, we just think it's a weather balloon. So, like, I think there's there's a lot of complicating things to um, the the shade how decisions get made. Um, and I just, I think like, you know, it's key for the storytellers to try to get as many facts as, as correct as you're talking about with Andrew Jackson. Um, and I think, you know, our, our team media, uh, the media for each team now is like so much focused on selling a particular story that right. they will just check with the facts that make it uh, fit their, their narrative. Right. And, and, and going back to like, uh, so Hiram talked about in the uh, in the pod, he said, you know, it's progressive versus conservative, change versus staying the same, right? And and then he also talked about, you know, our, excuse me, um, so change versus staying the same. And I, when I first started getting into politics, uh, when I was tinkering around, like, with my ideas, I was like, I came up with a term I, at the time, I called conservative uh, a conservative progressive. That's what I labeled myself mm -hmm. at one point in time before I came up with the Madisonian Republican. <laughs> And the reason was is because there was like there's a lot of things that I want to conserve, but there's some things that we think I think we should change, right? And so, and 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 I look at our system and I go, that's what our system does. Are we a democracy or are we a republic? We're both. You know, are we? Well, 
are we ruled by the people or are we ruled by a small aristocracy? Both, right? Like we pick the aristocracy essentially. Um, now there are things in our system, our system of amendment process um, allows us to make changes. It allows us to progress, you know, as things in society changes, we should update the constitution. That's something that we should be doing regularly. Realistically, if you're in the house of representatives, those are the only laws you should be writing, write amendments, right? Yeah, for the most and, and, part. and if you can't, if it's, if it's not coalesced by enough people in the country to write a constitutional amendment where you can get 70 percenters to be like, yes, let's do it. Then it should be written at the state level. You know, like whatever you're doing in the government, it means you're not doing it right in the federal government. Um, so when you come to, you know, the, the Civil War and you look at the expanded federal power that happened afterwards, it, they just messed up. Like they just forgot their purpose. Like, yes, give, you know, uh, free free the slaves, right? As uh, Ulysses mm -hmm. S. Grant called them, he called them the freed people, right? Give them rights, allow them the opportunity to vote. It was not, but don't open up Pandora's box to, you know, now expand federal government power to solve every problem that we have, federal government right. there is, to, is there to solve the biggest of problems, the ones that affect the most Americans and the ones that most Americans can agree upon. It's that two bucket system, right? Are we able to, you know, are we, should we be free or should we be ruled, right? And, and it's a balance. And by writing a limited set of rules and amendments, you're doing both. Um, and mm -hmm. I think that we have to get back there. You know, we have to get back to that idea. <laughs> no, I, I think that's that's part of the challenge with with the two party system in general is um, and maybe it's always been nationalized. And it was just, you know, us being so young, growing up in this national political sphere. But, you know, uh, again, like my school board race in 2019 was very much a referendum on Donald Trump, which didn't make any sense for the school board race because. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but the federal government has very little to do with local education. Like it's that's truly that's a state issue uh, with like with a little bit of local control in order to make things right uh, for the particular locality. But it but, it should really be about like what how you manage the schools and stuff. It shouldn't at all be about who's in the White House. But because of the national environment and sort of the national like, oh, you're a Republican or you're a Democrat and trying to uh, fit all the, the things in that basket onto someone, I, I think that's what it ruins it and i think you know um i that just it's, it becomes a challenge with with how you get the representation at different levels with with different issue sets yeah and then and and kind of um can you imagine a scenario where like a presidential con contender picks up education as a topic which is it's trending up the ladder right so like now it could be a conservative right a conservative and they could be running as a republican small government right as president federal government and on a platform mm -hmm. of like better education for american citizens and it's like well now you've taken this idea and you've you've completely abandoned your principles to solve this mm -hmm. because you're afraid of the other guy and and right. you know when i when i when i think about like if you move the problem all the way up to the top of the chain what you're saying is you don't trust yourself or your team to get this job done at the state or local level, which means you have a bad organizational structure. It means that you know you're a set of, a set of bad leaders and you're not gonna be able to, to move your leadership all the way down to the ground to make the change that needs to happen. Um, and you're willing to just make an argument to the American people, allow it to be majority rule, which is basically pure democracy and a mob rule. And now you have completely abandoned the principles that we were founded on. You're not pretending to be a Republican at all anymore. Um, I mean. I can see that happening, you know, like, I don't think it's that far out of the realm of possibility that that's where we're going based on the rhetoric that we hear nowadays. Yeah, but it, and it's all, it goes back to like selling like the same basket to everyone, like, right. you know. Because uh, parents uh, matter. <clears throat> that's press. your Republican message. Eventually it's going to end up in the federal government. Mm -hmm. Right. Because you said, because the federal candidates campaigned on that because that's what the local candidates thought might be important. And so everyone sticks to their same talking points and doesn't tailor the message to a particular task. And then once you get into the Congress, you're like, well, I, I don't have anything else better to do. So I might as well kind of tinker with this thing. Um, and I, you know, one of the other challenges I think is like um, Republicans in general is they kind of like their, their sort of issues are like anti-issues. It's sort of like, well, 
the other team is is for this and so we're going to be against this right and if it's just a bunch of of negatives um then once you once you have some kind of power like you know what do you what do you build your coalition on and i think that's where so many times the republicans get in trouble when they get in power Mm because they just ran about so like we're not going to do this we're not going to do this we're not going to do this and so it's kind of like well we just we'll, we'll sit on our hands and do nothing and then um people kind of get frustrated and they say well i've got these problems here but because you didn't run on a particular positive uh agenda you know however small even if it's delivered to government you, you know your positive agenda should be like rolling back the the uh, bureaucracy maybe um you know then, then you've got nothing to do with that and and uh, people are like, why should we give you power? Because you're just going to sit on your hands and do nothing. Right. And you see this at the local level. I mean, if you go, I don't know how many of out there are engaged in your local politics. If you go to like, I have been local Republican meetings, you will hear people stand up and say, the Democrats are doing it this way. So we're doing it this way. And then you go, then aren't you a Democrat? Right. Like, I mean, I don't understand the difference at this point. If And it, because it's, it's become so much about, well, the other guy is just evil. You know, they can't explain to me why the other guy's evil. They can't tell me what, you know, why these things are wrong, because I see you doing the same things. And you tell, you tell me to pretend like this isn't happening and only have me focus over here. And it goes, well, of course, like this is where we're going. Of course, this is how you're just copying each other. You don't really have any principles. And you talk about mm-hmm. I think you mentioned in there like. uh you know, having people that I can actually, I should have written it down. I get distracted sometimes, but um, like. But like, like the positive, like having a positive uh, thing. Yeah, you, you, have to have, you have to have a real message to people, not just against the people. And so, you know, back to, and I, I hate to keep pumping my own stuff here, but like back to the articles where I'm, re- I'm, I'm trying to explain the parties and the power that took place. Power broke. The power structure broke with Andrew Jackson. And the power vacuum that was left after him was grasped by a bunch of people that wanted to preserve slavery. And so there's a lot of similarities between Andrew Jackson and Donald J. Trump, except for one thing, their principles. So Andrew Jackson ran as a limited government guy. He goes, the aristocracy that is leading you has lost its way. Vote for me. And people did vote for him. And the reason they voted for him is because the aristocracy had lost his way. In this book, you know, they talk about John Quincy Adams and they talk about all the things that makes John Quincy a a bad leader in this time frame, for realistically. And I again I write about it, and I'm a huge John Quincy fan, but as president, you know, he he was out of touch with the people. And Andrew Andrew Jackson was very much in touch. Um, like I said, Andrew Jackson vetoed bill after bill where Donald Trump signed omnius bill after omnius bill. So Donald Trump came in, he broke the power structure. He had no principles at all. And now he's gone. And what do you see right now? You see a power vacuum. The Republican party shattered and the Democratic party splintering off. Um, They're fighting and, and moving in towards progressivism. And then you see the remnants of power trying to scoop everything back up. Um, the forward party, principles first, all these things. But the thing that they are missing is a foundation, you know? And again, bad power structure because they don't want to listen to the people. They, and I've I've been part of both of these organizations or at least tried to be part of both of these organizations. And they dictate from the top down. They, mm-hmm. you know, they struggle at communicating or listening to people. And, and yes, sometimes that's because the people that are trying to communicate to them don't understand how to articulate, but they're very passionate. So it's it looks like that person maybe isn't the right person, but good leadership understands how to cultivate those people into good leaders. They they understand how to give that person the information and help them into communicate their message properly. And I just I don't see that with principles first. I don't see that with uh for because I don't know what they stand for. Ranked choice voting. Like, I, I don't see what that does for our country. I don't see an actual ideology to hold on to. It's just another issue, and you've just created another social club. And I think that's where you and I, what we're trying to do with the Madisonian Republicans is like, look, we're going to tell you what we believe. We believe in limited federal government. We believe that people can govern themselves. We believe that the state should have more power, right? 
we don't believe in these other things. And we're going to explain to you why we believe them. We're going to give you the information of what happened and why the people made the decisions. And then we're going to let you make the decision on your own. If you want to be part of my group, yeah. be part of my group, you don't have to agree with me. Come in and disagree with me. And that's the biggest thing I see flawed with our system, whether it's the Republican Party, the Democratic Party, the Principles First, or the Ford Party. They do not accept dissent. If you dissent with right. them, it's not the fact that they tell you to go away. It's the fact that they don't invite you. It's the fact that they push you away. They turn away from you. And then if you dissent with them, when they push you away, they wield your emotion and your empathy against you. And I'll go back to when I was running for, or after I ran for office, I got into a little battle with Hung Kao, right? Because I didn't I had reached out. I had tried to have meetings. I had offered to write legislation. I'm doing everything in my power. Like, in my opinion, I'm just a regular citizen who's donated his time and information to help this guy. And like, I can't even get a minute meeting with him. And I ran against him. I paid the, the fundraising fund for the Republican Party so I could get on the stage, get my ideas heard. And I'm listening to people in my community tell me, I like your ideas. You should go help him. So I try. And they, they refused the meeting. Um, I go while they're uh, door knocking and I try, I asked again, the campaign manager told me, no, he's too busy fundraising and fundraising calls. And of course that sets me off. I'm already tense and nervous. You know, I'm just a regular person. I'm intimidated by this atmosphere. Like I don't want to be here. Um, and he goes, well, if you want to talk to him, now's your chance. This is your chance. And I'm like, you're telling me that I don't have I'm not important because I don't have money is what I hear when you tell me that he's too busy fundraising and stuff like that. Um, and I go ask my question. It's a little bit heated. We get in a little bit of a spat. And then it was a whole, it was a whole thing. I was a little angry. Like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to deny. I got a little loud. Right. But like, I was loud at like, why 435? Like, why won't you answer my question? Why can't we have this conversation? Why do you get to dictate to me, the person that put in all the work for my community to give you this information? Why can't you just take 30 minutes and sit down with me and listen to me? Like, you represent me. You work for me, not the people that pay your fundraising bills. Like, you represent the person that lives in the district, and you're not taking the time to listen to me. That is not representation, right? And so I have a meeting. And the campaign manager sits down and says, his children were there. You assaulted him verbally. You, How dare you? How dare I? How dare you not listen to me? How dare you not do your job? How dare me not put my soul and my effort into trying to solve a problem because I'm fearful of where we're going in our country? And like, all I'm trying to do is help you. And you won't even take the time to listen to me, which is literally your job. And they've forgotten that. They've completely forgotten that. We don't have a foundation anymore. Nobody's really trying to like solve the problems. They're just trying to win. That's it. They're just trying to win and make money. Yeah, and I think like our friend George Santos is probably the worst example of that. Just someone who won, did whatever it took to get in there, and he did it. And uh, I, I sent you this from my, um, not my Senate, but the Senate history book, the, the guy, the Senator Hugo Black from Alabama. And um, the note is like, you get elected in November and you don't get seated until December the next year. So he spent uh, those, those months reading extensively in economics, politics, and government, beginning with Adam Smith's Wells of the Nations, and moving through the works of Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, and other founding fathers. He read Plutarch, Suetonius, Seneca, Cicero, and Livy. He studied Montesquieu, Rousseau, Locke, Spencer, and Veblen. He read the records of the Constitutional Convention. What an education. And I just like, I thought of you when that happened, because like, I don't, you know, how many people in, in Congress have ever read any of those books? Maybe a couple in like a, a grad school or a PhD program, but there's not many PhDs. Uh, maybe they read a little bit of Seneca or Cicero or something in their their law school, but probably not. They probably spent more time on torts and civil litigation, and you know they know how to write a crappy uh, defense of some case and you know find it whatever sections of the U.S. code that they can throw at you to make it sound like they know what they're talking about. But they don't know how to govern it. You know they don't know they don't know the foundations. And so when someone comes and says, you know, maybe we should raise taxes. Their immediate thought is, well, no, my party says no taxes, no taxes at all. But I also, you know, I, I kind of want to get reelected. And I know if I 
turn the spigot and I turn off some of the gravy train, that's going to hurt me. So no taxes and more spending because I want to stay in power. You know, like there's no thought behind it. There's just, you know, you're literally pushing the nation off a cliff that uh, was going to, it's going to, you know, our checks are going to come due at some point. Um, you know, at some point we get a, we're going to stop printing money. At some point, China's going to stop buying our debt. Uh, Saudi Arabia is going to stop buying our debt. And we're going to be stuck holding the bag. And that's when the real austerity is going to happen. And we're going to be stuck. And again, no one in Congress and no one, no, no one in the government really understands how to stick through and, and work through these issues. Instead, they're just kind of like, oh, the other side's bad. They're much worse. And it's their fault. You know, if they had, if they had done something, you know, when they were in power, you know, oh my gosh, tisk tisk. You know, that's all we get from them. Right. And like, I like, I can understand, like, you know, I look at the forward party and I look at principles first and I go, I admire what you're doing, right? Like, I don't, I'm not trying to tell you like to quit. Like, I'm trying to tell you that maybe you're wrong, you know, like maybe you're just listening to the wrong people. And like, you're like, maybe if you're in the party and you're up in the leadership, if whether you're Heath Mo Mil uh, Mayo of principles first or Adam Kinzinger, Liz Cheney, or if you're, you know, um, Andrew Yang of the Ford party, maybe the, all the people that you listen to are inside your circle. Mm -hmm. Like maybe you need to listen to somebody outside of your circle. Maybe other people know information too. And, and yeah, they have long hair sometimes. And yeah, they wear a flannel sometimes. And yeah, they are really passionate sometimes, but maybe they put in enough work and like, they're just here to help you. And instead of, you know, I feel like I've been pushed away from the forward party. I feel like I've been pushed away from principles first. I went to the conference last year and I was very disappointed by all the people who told me like the things I wanted to hear in person, but kind of like turned their shoulders so they could walk away from me. And then like, I never got any follow-up and you can blame that on me. I would say that my communication skills have gotten better from that point to this point. But again, I go back to that leadership point and I go, you should have found, you should have just seen the passion in me and tried to cultivate it as opposed to pushing it away. And I don't think about it about me. I think about, I worry about your structure. I worry that you're not going to be successful and I want you to be successful because if you're pushing me away, you're pushing somebody else that could be helpful away. Yeah. And if there's anything that I've learned from reading history is that the most, the People are power. That's what representation is. Representation is communication. Representation is power. Hiram Lewis says it in um, in the uh, podcast. He says, uh, he goes, that's how you properly communicate. When you make the groups smaller, right? When you, when you, you break them down into like something that's tangible, something that you can actually control, which is what I talk about with Republicanism a lot, is now you can actually have a conversation. You can actually understand each other. You can get together. And I think that's where Principles First and Forward Party is kind of missing the boat. They don't have that foundation. They don't have that structure of power. Um, and they're just trying, they're just doing things like everybody else does it. And yeah. you're not any different then. You know, if you want to be different, if you want to suck up that vacuum power, then instead of having me come to Principles First, you should have me speak at Principles First, realistically. Like, I mean, I could talk about representation as communication. I can explain limited government to people and I can do it in a very concise manner. I've worked very hard at it. I can take a one minute and 37 second video and I can show it to my waitress, right? At a, at a restaurant. And within five minutes, I've got her understanding what I'm trying to teach to people. And you should like, we talk about this with the Republican party and knocking doors. There's no structure on how they knock doors. They just go and they go vote for this guy, right? They don't say anything. They don't teach you to say anything. You could walk, like if you were the forward party and you were principals first, like this little video, like you could show that to people and they can, and you can give it to your staff to, and actually be able to communicate something of value. Ranked choice voting is an idea. It's just not a very good idea. And you need to be able to let go of bad ideas and move on to the next one. No, I mean, like if it was, if it was so great, they would have done a long time ago. And like, you know, what make, what might make it more, work better is computers. And I think at this point, people don't trust computers voting, right. uh, tackling votes. Like, so you, you haven't really fixed the, the whole trust of elections process. You've added more steps to it and probably made it more, uh, untrustworthy. And if you're trying to, uh, fix elections where people can trust them and you can get sort of more moderate candidates and you're just opening up avenues for, not that it's going to be abused, but for people to have the perception that it's abused and the stories that can be told around it are said, well, election was stolen. Uh, it doesn't count, you know. 
Um, that's not helpful. And it, it, and then and then like and then what are you running on? You just like well, we're just like everyone else, I guess. Well, and so and this is the thing that that irritates me is especially at the local level. You know, they they uh, they'll campaign campaign, especially in Virginia right now. It's on um, election integrity. And it's like, we got to have IDs and all this stuff. And it's like, I'm not opposed to having an ID at the at the ballot. Like, I'm not opposed to that idea. However, again, you're just like, you're focusing on the wrong problem. Elections are stolen by the parties and the PACs during the primary process. And if you're not willing to tell the people that as a candidate, then you're part of the problem or you don't understand the problem, which means you shouldn't be running for office. Um, and, you know. There's just not enough people in the community that know that, and there aren't enough people in the community challenging them because they wield your emotion against you. They say, well, you didn't say it nice to me. Well, no, you need, you're not being nice by do, you're by misleading us, by telling us it's one problem when it's really another problem that you don't want us to look at because it actually benefits you, the people inside the party. And again, Look at your local governments, people. Look at your local parties. Look at the people on your board of supervisors. Look at the people in your, your his house district. Are they changing? Is power changing or is it staying in the same hands? Is it going from one person to the next person in line because they make cut deals and they're like, I'll support you if you support me and da da da, da. Yeah. It's not about the ideas anymore. It's about who you know. It's about the aristocracy, you know? And back to Andrew Jackson, break the aristocracies. Right, like break up the power, start a new aristocracy, but one based on a foundation of limited government and self governance and and stuff that actually matters. Um, yep. So, I I'm sorry, I get very. This was a very exciting podcast for me because That's right. like Hiram like really got me going. Like I love people like that. And if you listen to if you go back and you listen to Matt Lewis podcast, you'll notice something similar about both Hiram and me. We're very passionate and we speak really fast. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> and if Hiram, if you ever listen to this, I'd love to talk to you. Just like we should be really good friends because you're really cool. I like your conversation. Um, but John, before we go, let's talk about like, so Hiram really highlights a problem here. Um, and it's something that we've been talking about and that there is a myth between the left and the right. And it, and, and it's a broken power structure on the, mm -hmm. in the party side. Well, how do we fix that? Do you have any ideas? Uh, I think, no, I don't have any ideas. I mean, I think like the Republican, you know, the, the whole premise of a party, and I'll just say from my experience, when I ran for school board, I got the party's endorsement because I knew that would be helpful because I knew it would sort of put me in a basket of goods. And not that per se, like all the issues matter for the local election, but it was sort of de facto credibility. And I think that's what what you what is um, you know being accepted by the social tribe. So if you're gonna if you're gonna fix the problem of parties uh, dictating what the basket of goods are, what someone has to purchase in order to get the membership in the party, you got to replace that with some other kind of credibility. And I think um, perhaps what we're doing with the podcast and the the Madison Republican meetings and the blog and stuff is trying to build our own credibility that's outside of that power sphere. Um, so that when we come to people and we say, like, I'm Jeff Mayhew, I'm running for Congress. Did you uh, know you said, what do you do? So, well, you know, I'm, you know, did you know there's an election in the next year? Right. And, you know, you, you've sussed it out. Um, but Figure like, out what they know before you tell them what to know. Right. But then once you, when, you know, like you say, hey, like, I've got ideas. And, here, you know, it's not just me being like, oh, I got ideas and you should vote for me. Like, I've got a whole backlog of work. I built this little grassroots organization. I've got people that believe in me. And I know you can believe in me, too. Like. That's a compelling story that can, you could tell outside of the party system. So I think if if you're going to fix the, the parties at the different levels, like you got to replace that kind of credibility that you get sort of, you know, oh, this person's part of this country club. So we know, you know, we can we can fill in the, the details and we don't have to think about it, because I think that's what so much of the problem is, is like there's a lot of emotion in this. And that's a big part of it, of politics. Mm -hmm. And you're not going to fix human nature where emotion and tribalism takes in. I think it's a matter of being able to uh, have a substitute good, you know, sort of like, yeah, I'm not necessarily part of that tribe, but um, you can trust me in this aspect. I, you know, I, I think that's it. I, I mean, um, I don't know if you've got ideas on, on, has, on how it would work, but I think like it's it's a matter of replacing the, the trust. Yeah. So, I mean, I agree with you. I mean, that's important when you're, if you're going to create new parties or you're going to reestablish the parties that are there, you know, I come from the idea 
um, I, I'm a Madison guy, right? I mean, I named our organization after his mindset and the way that he thought. And Madison was first against parties. And then what did he do? He leaned into them. It was all about he, them. Because you, you, he realized the same thing that I realized, and I think um, other people have as well, is you can't avoid it. You can't avoid the factions. And again, how do you make a problem palatable? You break it down into smaller groups. So mm -hmm. this is how I approach the party system. <laughs> So like we should have more parties realistically. So like one party would be like the presidential, the executive party, okay? And that party's ideology realistically should be bigger federal government, limited federal government. Like that should be the ideological powers. It's like people fighting to use the federal government to solve problems and people fighting to say we should put that at the state level, okay? And then you work your way down. Now you have like a state party. And so like you could flip flop, right? Like, cause your mm -hmm. state party, you know, like maybe you've got uh, corporate rights, uh, property rights, health, things that like make a difference on your day to day lives that are like part of the upper level of the economy in your state are going to have more of an effect on it. Um, and you join based on that. And then you go down and you have like a house party that's more of like a, a people style and you break these things down. So, you know, you could be somebody that's limited federal government, but very progressive in the house party. Right. Because you go, I want to make change as soon as possible. And I'm going to use my local federal government to do that. And your ideology from federal to, or from the executive party to the House party are completely opposite of each other because of where you believe the power should be, not necessarily what you believe government should be doing. Right. And understanding the difference in those things are really, really important because, like, like I said before, a progressive conservative. Right. You want to make change. If you're at the federal level, you're writing amendments. We're expanding the house. We're campaign finance reform. We're doing stuff that makes a, a difference. Um, if you're at the local level, like maybe you want to figure out a way to like in, you know, uh, I don't know, help out your your local economy with some different things. I mean. I might disagree with you, right? Like I might still go limited government in every bucket down the list as possible and go just give me the person, the individual, as much power as possible. But I can see where people would want to change that along the way, especially when you get to education, right? And we talked about that with the federal mm -hmm. level. Like maybe you want to make that change at the local level on education. And, and that's a place where I would say like, you should be very involved with your with your child's education. You should understand what's going on and you shouldn't be afraid to speak up on that. Um, so that's just some ideas that I have. I mean, they're totally like, you know, I just made them up today. So I haven't really ironed them out. The other thing that I would do is I would separate the parties from the candidates, right? So like you pick your party, right? You, you identify that, but the party is like the business. It's the corporation. Okay. It runs the operation. It gets the message out. It's your fundraising mechanism, but the candidates do not get to talk to the parties, okay? And so what this does is you say, okay, if you filed and you meet these requirements to run for office and you file your paperwork, you get equal amount of money from the fundraising. And the candidates are no longer fundraising at all. And you you can lower the amount of money that you need to run for office because I think there are ways that you can communicate without having to use the local party structure. A podcast mm -hmm. or just setting up an event where like if you're running for state delegate, like there's two people running for a primary right now. I don't know what they're doing with their race, but realistically, they should work together with the party and say, we're going to be at this location every single Thursday, and you, the people, can come talk to me so we can actually have a conversation, right? right? And that doesn't cost you any money, You don't, but instead, you're spending so much time talking to these people with money and fundraising that you don't have time to talk to the regular people, right? And and against your principles, your ideas of what your, your job's supposed to be. And so if you separate those things out because... Right now, and you know this, and I know this, if you want to run for office, you have to run a business and, and make a profit and also read all these books. Yeah. Like we talk about what makes a good representative, what makes a good senator, as Robert Byrd was talking about, somebody that takes the time to read all this stuff, somebody that takes the time to understand the foundations and the principles, and the people that are running for office, they only know the business side. Mm -hmm. They don't have the foundation. They don't have the principles. And so I think by more parties, separating out the party structure, the business side from the candidates, and, and just allowing the, the candidates to have their voice heard, you know, because money drowns regular people's voice out. 
you know, they wield your emotion against you. They tell you don't, they don't know. They wield your insecurities against you. They tell you, you don't know what you're talking about when in reality, they don't know what they're talking about, you know? And instead of listening to you, they tell you to go away or they ignore you or they make plans with you and they don't follow up. And then they were like, oh, you know, it's whatever. But those are things that happen in society that happens in regular every, everyday life, but it doesn't mean we can't fix them. It doesn't mean we can't change. Like Kyron was talking about, you know, I think Matt Matt took took uh, what he was saying like a kind of very dystopian. Like the, it's broken. Like we're we're screwed. But it's like no, like it is broken. We we have moved away from where we are, but it doesn't mean we can't move back. Like if we made change in one direction, why can't we make change in the other direction? Well, humans humans are always broken, and I don't know if we'll ever get fixed. So well, it's just human nature and, and such. Um, but your, your thought about the, um, splitting into different levels and stuff, like, I, I would say like, that's just the, the sort of going back to like, uh, the high room is very much like, there's no one principle that unites all this, but I think like, if you were going to draw like a major principle, I think you could say like the principality of a uh, principle of subsidiarity and solidarity. And it's just right. like putting things at the appropriate level. And so something like education, you could be quote progressive at the local level and you say like, Every student gets $25,000. It's paid for by the taxpayers. It goes into, you know, paying for that kid's education. You know, like that's a lot of money. And that's very like socialist in a certain sense of the, the community funding education. But you said like, but that's at the local level and that's controlled by the parents and that's controlled by a school board or something that sets maybe whatever standards there are. Right. And actually there's no one at the federal level that gives any of that money. You know, right. it wouldn't make sense for you to pay your income tax throw that money to the federal treasury and then it goes slowly trickles down into the local level. Like just keep it at the local level because that's where it makes sense. But flip side, you know, maybe your local your local county doesn't need a militia or something. Maybe you kind of want a national army or a national navy or air force in order to protect the common good and sort of keep the borders secure, um, keep the, you know, like that's a very national thing. And that that's where it makes sense where you do put money towards the federal to pay for that. And so like, I think, if, you know, that might be a more of a unifying principle along those, that aspect of, you know, not just like, oh, conservative at the national and progressive at the local level or vice versa, you know, where, or, you know, just pure libertarianism where like, well, look, don't, uh, don't tread on me and I won't tread on you. you no, know, I, I think like finding that kind of common ground for all, like, I think that, that might be, that might be the way out to, to help fix that. Right. And, and so I, like, I like the campaign finance idea too. Well, I mean, you know, like, we got to stop the flow of money. Like, I'm sorry. Like, it is the biggest problem, and that and the lack of representation. Um, but you you made me think of another thing, and I talked about uh, Andrew Jackson and, and John Quincy Adams already. And this book, it it does a really good job actually talking about the principles that they both kind of shared, right? But how they approached them differently, and so. John Quincy and Andrew Jackson understood that the United States Union, in order for it to be safe and sovereign, and I think John Adams also understood this, was it really needed to shine from sea to sea. Like mm -hmm. we needed to get rid of all the European influences um, it, because otherwise you're always going to be at war. You know, yeah. I mean, Madison even kind of thought that like they tried to push into Canada, like they were trying to protect themselves. It's such a such a natural thing for people to do. Like when you are living so close to an adversary, you're going to feel threatened, even if like even if you have good relations with that country, it doesn't mean that the people that live on the border aren't going to fight each other. And as a leader of the country, you have to understand this and be able to make sure that you don't end up in constant wars. So like. The the Seminole battle in Florida, where Andrew Jackson goes in and basically, ca you know, he he captures Florida essentially, and everybody is against Andrew Jackson except for John Quincy Adams because John Quincy Adams and Andrew Jackson know the same thing. They need Florida, and they're going to figure out a way to get Florida, and they're very clever about how they do it. Now the Spaniards, their empire is dwindling. They they don't have a lot of presence there, and then they're not able to protect their own people and then the citizens in Georgia from the Seminoles' attacks. So the you know, the Indians are going across the border and creating these problems. Andrew Jackson goes in there, he squashes it. He sees an opportunity to seize Florida, which he may or may not have been instructed by the president. I think there's a little bit of discrepancies in history of whether he was or wasn't, but he takes the bullet um, and he says, well, I guess I did this and now we have to live with it. And John Quincy Adams, everybody in uh, James Monroe cabinet is against 
what happened. And they were like, denounce it. He hung two British soldiers. He's like, you know, we need to apologize. We need to do this. And John Quincy Adams is like, not so fast. We need to keep Florida, you know? And so that's where these principles align. Okay. That's where it's the idea of protecting the union at all costs, making sure that your first intention as a leader, as a, as the federal power is keeping your country sovereign and safe. Um, and then working together to get that done. Sometimes some people on the ground get their hands dirty, right? They have to do the things that are uncomfortable and that we don't want to do. And I don't want to do like, I don't ever want to be Andrew Jackson in his position. I'm not that person, but people like that need to exist, like plain and simple, because people like that exist on the other side, you know, and the difference is Andrew Jackson understood a line. He had principles. He worked to protect his people as much as he could. Um, and we as a nation understood that back then. And now I don't think we do that. <laughs> we'll teach him. We'll teach him. No We're problem. trying. We're trying. Um, well, this has been a, a long podcast. I've been talking a lot, John. How was it? It was good. I'm going to listen to it. <laughs> so, um, I want to remind everybody we've got our next Madisonian Republican meeting. February 18th coming up. Uh, it's a Saturday. It's 4 to 6 p.m. at Giuseppe's in Haymarket. Go to our website and RSVP. Um, you know, we're just trying to we're trying to share information, uh, <laughs> plain and simple, um, help build some sort of foundation for people to make your own decisions on. Um, and so you're not really electing people that don't know what they're doing anymore, because I think we've all voted for people that we go, maybe I shouldn't have voted for that guy. <laughs> <laughs> we'll fix it in the next election right that's always the motto yeah next time we'll win <laughs> anything to add no uh again just thanks for everyone for coming out to i'm sorry not coming out but listening to us and again i, I would love to see you at, on february 18th um it was a lot of fun last time and uh, you know the rcps just help us gauge the room size and, and making it sure it's all set up and comfy and cozy for you so it really helps us with the with the organization you know we're not going to sell you sell you or give it away or put you on some list um uh, so rest assured yeah and and be sure to go check out matt lewis in the news podcast he writes for the daily beast he's a really good follow um his podcast is fantastic and hiram lewis's book i haven't read it i just listened to the podcast i ordered it today because i'm like i have to read that book it's on amazon you should go buy it maybe we'll read it together and have a conversation later so um reach out uh you can contact us through our website or you can follow us uh on our Substack, politics and parenting um other than that peace and love